speaker and uh, so good afternoon everyone welcome to our first public facing aad sessions hosted by creature aad sessions are a series of public conversations that bring together researchers and practitioners from the school of art architecture and design at london met and the wider world to exchange knowledge cross fertilize ideas and between disciplines these interdisciplinary sessions are usually held on a Thursday late afternoon or over lunchtime. Today's session is hosted by Creature, our new research center for creative arts, cultures, and engagement. I'm Wesley Ling, professor of transcultural arts and design from the School of Art, Architecture and Design, and the director of Creature. As part of a research series on performance, monuments, and public spaces, Today's sessions is initiated from one of Creature's research strengths in public, co all coordinated and organized by Dr. Yaxet Lewis Scarsel. There are two more sessions within this series in the month of March. You can find the full schedule of AAD sessions on Creature website. Dr. Scarsel is reader in art and performance at the School of Art, Architecture and Design, also Creature's deputy director. I'd like to pass on to Dr. Scarsell to introduce his research strength in public, the research series, and most of all, our invited speaker who joined us today from Australia. A big thank and warm welcome to you, Dr. Ruth Sasakali. Without further ado, over to you now, Yaxet. Thank you very much, Wesley. So Wesley and I are so excited to have you all here this uh, first uh, public talk by our research center. And um, so in particular, as Wesley mentioned, so this is part of the in public series performance monuments and public spaces. And the point of this of this series is that we interrogate the relationship between art, design and the public sphere through a range of both local and international perspectives. And so we ask questions regarding the role of public art in relation to current issues, such as the impact, for instance, of the Black Lives Matter movement, the future of public facing practices post COVID. And doing this, we hope to redefine the role of public art and culture and look for new strategies in public engagement. So what a better start today to, to uh, this series than to zoom out to the other side of the globe and to hear from Dr. Ruth Fazakali, live from Adelaide, Australia. And as she pointed out that Ruth is currently for in her uh, time of 11.30 p.m. And thank you so much, Ruth, because we really appreciate the time difference. So, so thank you so much. It's very generous of you. Um, so we are delighted to welcome uh, Ruth as an affiliate member to our Research Centre Creature specifically specifically working with our in public research group. So I'm going to give you a little bit of details about Ruth's career and specialisms. So uh, Dr. Ruth Fazakali is an academic developer with the Teaching Innovation Unit, University of South Australia. She's an educator and researcher and her career spans diverse higher education and professional settings underpinned by a sustained engagement with the theory, policy, management and professional practice of art in public spaces. Situated within the fields of contemporary visual art and culture and informed by urban studies and cultural geography, Ruth's research focuses on the discourses and histories of public art and the effects of those discourses on urban and social and spatial relations. I'm very proud of the fact that Ruth is also a contributor to our MA Public Art and Performance course here at the School of Art, Architecture and Design at London Met. And she also coordinates the Public Art Research Network. And I should say that their Facebook group is also my first port of call whenever I need to know what's happening right now in public art around the globe, that's where I go. So I do do um, invite you to check out this, uh, this uh, Facebook group and, and the network itself. Um, just a reminder once again that we are recording this event and uh, again feel free to switch off your camera if you're not um, comfortable with that but uh, or, or keep it on and we like to see faces it's always very useful and so um, yes I'm, I am going to put the the link to to um, to uh, Ruth's Facebook group um, during the talk and then at the end we're going to also have a chance for some Q&A and, um, and I think that's it. So thanks again, R Ruth, and, and feel Over free to, to start. <laughs> okay, I'll just share. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. 
Yes, perfect. It's good, Yasser. Yes. Great. Well, I'll launch straight in. Um, I want to begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of country um, in Adelaide. That's the Gauna people um, on whose land I'm located at the moment. I recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging. Thanks again for the invitation to um, speak with you today, Yatsek and um, everybody. I, what I'm hoping to do is present some current research and thinking. I want to take the opportunity to, I've taken the opportunity really, to reflect on some of the events of 2020 through the lens of Australian monuments and memorials that respond to Australia's problematic memorialization of its colonial past and which offer resistant and alternative perspectives. I'm gonna begin with a short summary of my thinking before turning to some specific examples of public monuments and artwork with hopefully some time for discussion at the end and Yatsek, you might have to um, throttle me um, by that stage. I've written um, this paper because I was conscious that I um, might not be quite awake properly at this time. So um, bear with me while I, um, if I'm wandering, trying to read. Okay. In a recent issue of Memory Studies, Astrid Earle asks, what is being remembered during, during Corona times? What will be remembered after Corona times, after the pandemic has passed? She speculates that crises work like retrieval cues for collective memory, from consciously drawn historical analogies all the way to non-consciously emerging stereotypes. Paradoxically, she writes, a transnationally operative virus has helped to, re to engender re-nationalism as patriotism and national repertoires are ransacked for historical analogies to understand the present and to legitimate political action. At the same time, memories of colonialism surface across the globe, including memories of the diseases brought by colonizers to places like Australia, alongside the triggering of xenophobia, racism and racial stereotyping. All this takes place in the midst of the widespread circulation of images through social media and news media, through social and news media, including the rapid and reiteration and recycling of images of physical and political violence. The 2020 protests and removal of US and UK statues of racists and slavers has brought renewed attention, renewed national visibility to the ongoing discussions in Australia about our own statues and more generally about the ways in which we remember or choose to forget invasion and colonization and their continuing impact. It's also raised the voices of those commentators defending public statues as integral to the fabric of our cultural heritage with claims that their removal equates to silencing, erasing or rewriting Australian history I'm sure you're familiar with parallel conversations. These concerns are somewhat ironic, I think, in the Australian context, given that so much of this country's history has been ignored, repressed, misrepresented, or literally erased altogether. Personally, I see the debates of 2020 as pointing to the need to look at the specific relationships posited or, or enacted between violence, material culture, and memory in relation to statues and monuments as objects that not only suffer acts of violence, but may themselves be the active agent or weapon of violence. I'm thinking in particular of the writing of um, William Mitchell in talking about these issues. Charges of vandalism only reify contention over social values and normative behavior often with the effect of disguising political conflict and discrediting content, discontent. In writing about the Roads Must Fall campaign, Sabina Marshall uh, from KwaZulu-Natal University has problematized the term vandalism along with related terms such as desecration, 
to lay out a broader politics of de defacement and the visual and performative forms it can take. These range from firstly, the treatment of monuments as a canvas for markers of dissent by damage, graffiti, or splashing paint or excrement, for example. Secondly, the use of a monument as a stage or site for the performance of protest. To thirdly, the outright prevention of new statues. Or finally, the erection of counter monuments and other types of additions. It's this latter category of counter monumental practice broadly taken to mean an objection or resistance to a specific monument or a class of monuments or formal conventions that I'll be sharing examples of today, often created by Australian Aboriginal as well as non-Aboriginal artists in order to recover and make visible the stories, voices and voices that complicate the narrative of this country's past and its shared history since white settlement. It's by no means a defin definitive list of examples. Um, um, there are many more. Um, and I'm not claiming any privileged or insider knowledge about these works here either. Especially in my selection and discussion of examples, I'm drawing information from an, the extensive public works and research of many Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities, artists, active, activists, historians, and scholars. So let's look back to 2020 in Australia, at least. As the story of the death of George Floyd was circulating across the globe in May, mining company Rio Tinto, Tinto ignored the objections of traditional landowners to knowingly blow up a, world, a site of world heritage significance with evidence of habitation dating back over 40,000 years. In June, the New South Wales government sent police to Hyde Park in Sydney to protect a Captain Cook statue from being vandalised during an unsanctioned BLM rally. Traces of spray painting action from the day before, attributed to a staff member from the Greens Party office, um, had already been washed away. Hyde Park's a regular rallying point for city protests including the Invasion Day protests held on our Australia Day holiday, the holiday that marks the landing of the first settlers at Botany Bay. In 2017, Cook's pedestal was marked with the slogans, change the date and no pride in genocide. The monument's a particular bone of contention, not only because of the standing figure of Cook, Captain Cook, but for the inscription which says Captain Cook discovered this territory in 1770. Black Lives Matter rallies continue to take place across Australia throughout 2020 in solidarity with those in the US. They've been used locally to highlight relations between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and police, and in particular, the failure by state and national governments to fully address the recommendations of the 1991 Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody and subsequent reports. Um, oh, in the pages out of order. The BLM marches and protests in Australia have taken place in the context of continuing systemic violence to the rights and liberties of Aboriginal people, ranging from dispossession of land to their disproportionate engagement with the criminal justice system. Interventions that cumulatively impact on every Aboriginal person in different ways every day. The Australian monumental landscape is dominated um, by, two, by memorials of two kinds. Those to national wars elsewhere, from the Crimean War to the Vietnam War, so, uh, Afghan war and so on. Um, and those commemor commemorating white exploration and settlement. Matthew Graves and Elizabeth Rechniewski um, in 2017 have mapped the much fewer group of monuments that explicitly commemorate violent conflict between Aboriginals and settlers. They note that until the 1980s, these were mostly memorials to white agents of violence 
or to white victims of Aboriginal violence, like this 1913 memorial in Fremantle to pastoralist Maitland Brown and three settlers killed by treacherous natives. This interpretation of events have, had long been held to be offensive by local Aboriginal communities. Following extensive historical research in 1988, the year of Australia's official bicentennial celebrations, the public action project based at the University of Western Australia, excuse me, lobbied the Fremantle City Council to add a plaque with this alternative wording, finally installed in 1994. Recognising frontier conflict is this 1984 Perth sculpture of an Aboriginal man, Yagan, in Perth. Um, it was initiated by Noongar community members who had been seeking a memorial since the early 70s and finally were able to commission it with the assistance of the West Australian Labor government. Yagan's known as a resistance fighter and has become an iconic figure in Western Australia. He was a Noongar man, one of the traditional owners of the Swan Valley region of Western Australia, where a British colony was established in 1829. The settlement claimed the productive land along the Swan River, leading to the dispossession of local people, inevitable conflicts over economic resources, food and water, and an escalating pattern of dispute and retribution as both Aboriginals and colonists attempted to enforce their own systems of justice. Following violent, a series of violent event, events, including Yagan's capture, exile and escape, a bounty was put on his head for which he was shot, then shot by a settler in 1833. His body was dismembered and his smoked head taken to England to be publicly exhibited as an anthropological curiosity, not an unusual practice at that time. In 1990, the Nyungar community requested the return of the head, which had been stored by the Liverpool Museum um, until 1964, when it was buried in an unmarked grave. The head was found and returned to Australia in 1997. It was finally reburied in the Swan Valley in 2010 at a site now named the Yagan Memorial Park. The sculpture has also been the target of repeated vandalism. It's been painted white, had its spear stolen and attempts made to remove its genitals. It's also been beheaded twice. Given the horror of such stories as Yagans, it shouldn't be a surprise that the artist Andrew Brooke turns to the carnival or sideshow as an iconoclastic device. This travelling work, first made for the 2010 Biennale of Sydney, is an inflatable bouncy castle. Black and white skulls in each of the four turrets um, are designed to dance up and down when anyone jumps around inside the walls of the castle. It's intended to be shocking, but also macabrely humorous, a means to talk about serious and painful issues that people don't want to talk about. In a related exhibition catalogue, book Andrew wrote, I want people to be conscious about the choices they make. Originally, it, the castle was restricted to those 16 years and over, but some hefty men were so rough with it that I decided to put a stop to people climbing on it. It was a good decision. People started paying more attention to the tension between its being a jumping castle and its being a war memorial. They may look like fun fair attractions, but it's also a commemoration of loss. In Europe, people of all ages visit First and Second World War sites, including Holocaust memorials, and learn through engaging with history and place. These places inspired me to create this piece. In this country, we lack memorials. This work, he writes, is for all those who haven't had a proper memorial. <clears throat> the 1980s, um, saw increased public commemoration um, of the deaths of Aborigines in colonial encounters and the beginnings of extensive national research and debate about the extent of frontier violence. The Aboriginal memorial shown here was conceived by John Mundine at the time of the 1988 Australian Bicentenary. Uh, at that time, John Mundine was an art advisor at Ramanjini 
um, in central Arnhem Land, where he describes his role as to make the world more aware and appreciative of Aboriginal art and culture. Looking back in 2015, Mundine writes that at a time when many Aboriginal artists and arts organisations were boycotting the bicentennial events, he argued the problem was to present um, Aboriginal culture without celebrating um, the bicentennial. He wanted to deny the myth of terra nullius and that Australia had been settled peacefully, that it was unoccupied and settled peacefully. Um, the work was um, uh, eventually, Mundine was able to secure funding for the work through um, the National Gallery of Australia who agreed to commission it. Um, it was initially shown at the Biennale of Sydney in 1988 and then brought to Canberra where it's now permanently housed at the National Gallery of Australia. It was created by 43 artists from Ramanjining and surrounding communities in central Arnhem Land. It's made up of 200 hollow log coffins, one for each year of white contact, representing a forest of souls, a war cemetery and the final rites for all Indigenous Australians who've been denied a proper burial. It's a quote from John Mundine. <clears throat> it evokes Aboriginal burial and memorial practices. In the hollow log or bone coffin ceremony, a naturally hollowed log is cleaned and painted with clan designs normally painted on the body. The cleaned bones of the deceased are painted and placed in the log along with, along with songs and dancing before the log is stood upright and then left to decay. Art historian and art critic Terry Smith described the memorial in 2001 as a smouldering reproach, a witness object that just doesn't just recall the past, but renews it, interrupting the performance of the present. Bachelor artist Fiona Foley has more recently observed the influence of the Aboriginal memorial, writing in 2018. It, galvan it galvanised the feelings of many in 1988. A potent forerunner in the nation's Aboriginal memorials made by Aboriginal individuals and societies for our war dead. In this respect, it inspired a whole genre of Aboriginal art. It impacted other fields of research as in the history wards at the turn of the 21st century and its concerns reverber reverberate with increasing force every year. Foley's written that she'd always wondered as a child why no one lived on Fraser Island in Queensland, bachelor country, a land rich with food and water resources. Once intensely populated, however, by the early part of the 20th century, most of the bachelor population had been massacred by white settlers or moved to Christian missions on the island or on mainland. As her own response to the claim that Australia was settled peacefully, Foley and a research assistant carried out research between 2002 and 2004 that unearthed 94 Aboriginal massacre sites on the public record in Queensland. Witnessing to silence, um, this work here is one result of that research. Commissioned for the new Brisbane Magistrates Court and installed in 2004, um, the installation consists of three parts, a water feature of a cast with cast bronze lotus stems, stainless steel columns embedded with ash in laminated glass and etched place names in granite pavers. Foley had initially claimed that the work referred to Australian bushfires and floods. Only when the work was installed did she reveal to the media that it was a memorial to massacres of Aboriginal people during the colonial settlement of Queensland in the early 19th century. Um, Graves and Rechnevsky uh, in 2017 um, observed that as campaigning, as campaigning by Aboriginal people became more prominent, the focus of memorialising uh, memorialization has shifted from Aboriginal people as passive victims of massacres to commemorating their roles as warriors in the defense of country in the frontier wars. Australia's National War Museum um, continues to exclude mention of um, the frontier, what are often called frontier war um, conflicts in its walls. 
The tightly controlled boundaries of commemoration of national wars offshore for many years also excluded explicit recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participation under the pretense that existing memorials included all Australians. This denied the fact that returned Indigenous soldiers from the First and even Second World Wars were denied the right to participate in ANZAC marches, refused access to many veteran benefits, and were barred entry to RSLs. However, this has changed. The centenary of World War I, and in particular the 2015 centenary of the Gallipoli campaign, commemorated as Anzac Day on April 25th each year, um, led to initiatives by the Australian War Museum um, to record and highlight, uh, sorry, Australian War Memorial, to record and highlight the participation of black soldiers in military service. In the lead up to the 2015 Anzac Day Cemetery, Senate Centenary, new memorials were dedicated um, to the service of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander servicemen and women. One in Adelaide in 2013 and another in Sydney's Hyde Park in 2015, both designed by Aboriginal artists. Um, in this example, um, we're looking at Meningi, a very small country town about 100 kilometres kilometers from Adelaide. Like hundreds of other towns across Australia, it has its own cenotaph first erected in 1928 as a monument to those fallen from the town who had died overseas in World War I. They stand in for the lost bodies of the dead. But the commemorative function of the sites also changed. The names of dead World War II servicemen were added. And in 2015, federal funding through the Anzac Centenary Local Grants Program enabled the transformation of an adjacent block of land into a memorial park with gardens, seating, new commemorative plaques in memory of local soldiers, a range of military paraphernalia, and new signs marking the service of marking service of the military, of those in the military, as well as nurses, land army, volunteer defense force, and Red Cross. Outside the park, but alongside it, sits this paste up mural of 18 of the 21 Naranjeri men from the region um, who served in World War I. Five of those men died in the war. The mural was unveiled on the same day that the Mor Memorial Park was officially opened and was part of, um, was listed in the schedule as part of the events um, on 29th of March, 2015. It was described by the local newspaper as an indigenous mural tribute Locals said the mural was a welcome addition to the town and would impress visitors as they passed it along Meningi's main street. And its main tourism, its main industry really, it's uh, one of its main industries is tourism. Uh, people passing through basically. The mural was created by Sydney street artist Hego with the collaboration of local one local descendant of the soldier, of these soldiers in finding a suitable location for the work. How Hego um, came to make this mural is told in the 2018 documentary Black Anzacs, and I won't go dwell on it here, um, except to say the images are from the book Nar Naranjeri Nan Anzacs by Doreen Katinuri. And he sought permission from the um, South Australian Museum who published the book and direct descendants of each of the Aboriginal soul soldiers to show the work, to create that work. It's a popular and clever insertion of Aboriginal faces into the Anzac story, but it points to something of a more complex narrative too. The men that served were all from, not from Meningi, but from Raukin, almost 50 kilometres away, then with an adult population of about 205. So 21 people out of 25 is quite a, um, out of 205 is a significant proportion. Raukin previous, was previously known as Port McLean, Mission it was established in 1859 as a mission for the boarding, schooling, and training of Aborigines by the Aborigines Friends Association. And it became a government controlled Aboriginal reserve in 1916. Schooling on these missions was explicitly designed to distance Indigenous children from their family and community influences, restricting the knowledge and practice of traditional language and culture. Until the 1960s, the Aboriginal reserve laws 
gave government power over all aspects of Aboriginal people's lives, restricting freedom of movement, custody of children, and control, even control over money and property. Officially, Aboriginal people were banned from enlisting between 1914 and, and 1916, and later only if one parent was European. Excuse me. Um, Doreen Katinuri writes in the book, Naranjeri Anzacs, when I look back over the history of my people, I see the protector interfering in all aspects of people's lives, most of the time for no good reason. Yet here they had a good reason, but did nothing to stop the men enlisting. My mother and her family always blamed the protector for these deaths. The Port Maclean Mission Church includes a memorial window to these men installed in 1925. And in 2015, the Raukan community also created its own war memorial and was able to secure funds from the same 2015 grants rounds. My last example. Um, this is Jonathan Jones, um, Skin and Bones, Barangal Diara. It's an installation, was an installation in 26, uh, one of the Caldor Public Art Projects. Um, in the, installed in the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney at the site of a former structure, the Garden Palace. The palace was built to house the Sydney International Exhibition of 1879 and remained a storehouse for the new Australian Museum's collections from this, um, a storehouse for the new Australian Museum's collection um, of Southeast, Southeast Frontier, spears, boomerangs, and other wooden artifacts that had been gathered for the ethnographical court of the exhibition. When the building burnt down in 1882, it destroyed a huge collection of irreplaceable cultural artifacts, including those of Jonathan Jones' um, Wiradjuri Camilleroy heritage. Jones, in this project, marks out the footprint of the building with shield forms distinctive to Southeast Aboriginal nations, reproduced in gypsum and echoing the mass of rubble left behind by the fire. There are numerous components to this project. It included a multi-channel soundscape throughout the site, um, which played the voices of eight Southeast Eastern Aboriginal language groups, naming the objects that had been destroyed by the fire. He planted a plot of native grasses in the botanic gardens to harvest seeds and to make, to make traditional bread. The installation was accompanied by performance, workshops, talks, and an educational program engaging Aboriginal artists and communities across the Southeast region of Australia with non-Aboriginal partners to share knowledge and tell stories of Indigenous objects, languages, cultural practices. Jones describes this project as raising the histories, as raising the histories embedded on the site and exposing themes of loss, memory and cultural identity. In exposing what remains, in doing so he's also exposing what remains, land and environment, culture and people. In doing so he counters um, colonial narratives of Aboriginals as nomadic savages. The project presents losses as those to be remembered and accounted for, however while focusing its efforts on cultural renewal. And that's where I was going to stop. So I've gone a little bit over time. Sorry, Yatsik. That's perfect. Thank you very much, Ruth. And of course, all these examples are giving us plenty of food for thought. And, and it's really interesting to see um, you know, the different you know, global perspectives on, on the subject. And Ruth, but as we start, um, uh, I'm going to invite obviously the, 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 our audience to, uh, to ask you some questions. But perhaps before we, we do that, if you can just help us uh, in, in defining uh, this idea of the counter monument and how it works in, in relationship to uh, traditional monuments as a concept. You were going to ask that <laughs> because I didn't do that here. Um, <laughs> this would be a good one to hear from Mechthild as well. <laughs> Mechthild, yeah. 
Who's going to give a talk in a few weeks' time, actually? <laughs> Hi, Mechdel. <laughs> <laughs> the term, I guess, has come to mean just about, you know, what's not, what's almost what's not counter memorial practice. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the, the forms, the tropes, the kind of languages that are used in um, monuments, contemporary monuments, um, have kind of become a bit ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. I guess where I'm where we see the language coming from is in relation to especially um, post Second World War memorialization, where you see very clear um, dialogic monuments, counter monuments, um, in the sense that um, there's a opposition or a um, response or a resistance to an existing monument or monumental site. Um, by the creation of a new object um, and that sits alongside it in some way. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have a resolution of the, you, you may or may not have, because you, you won't normally have a synthesis of those um, uh, two objects, but a kind of dialogue between them. It's also used, however, in another way. The term counter mon is, monument is used in a much broader way to talk about um, the practices of um, opposing traditional monumental forms or um, uh, the, even the idea of um, monuments as counter hegemonic um, uh, approaches. I'm rambling, but <laughs> there's a great paper uh, written in 2012 by Quentin Stevens, Karen Frank and myself. <laughs> where we looked at common um, usages of the term. Mm. I think what's shifted really since then is the ubiquity of those forms that we talked about so that um, it's almost, um, yeah, it's a new norm, I guess. You mm. can do it. And there is, there is definitely with the, the very term monument, it, it obviously conjures up and I think, you know, of course, we are reminded of, you know, through again, the Black Lives Matter movement, through uh, Extinction Rebellion to all, all sorts of other movements as well from the very different, different angles, this idea that we, we use the term monument and of course it is invariably problematic, but it's also provocational. It's one of the things, for instance, that we do as, as Ruth knows, what we do on the, on our MA public art is that we use a term, so we ask the students to create monuments, but of course, uh, typically in response to the idea, so more in from the perspective of a, of a counter monument, effectively. But we we use the term kind of you know to to question to question itself, you know, and um, uh, and it is it is an interesting one because it continues to to raise issues. Um, I'm going to ask uh, whether there's uh, there's any question in the uh, in, from the audience, uh, Nick has a question. Thank you, Nick. Yes, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your lecture. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I'm actually Australian, although I haven't, I haven't uh, lived in Australia for an awful long time. It's a question about, I mean, it's something that Yatsik referred to, but it's, it's a really interesting one. I guess the question of how do Aborigines themselves understand the meaning of memory? Um, if we talk about the, 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 the notion of ancestral traditions of memory, um, which are, of course, rooted in landscape. Um, when we look at the memorialization of events, it's, it, if you look at, if you juxtapose that against the Aboriginal understanding of memory, there's something fundamentally alien. Uh, and, and in many respects, the notion of mo memorialization, at least the way it's presented, whether in, in what, however form, mm. as a kind of construct, it's an 18th century invention. Um, it never really existed before the 18th century. You know, it's the time which we memorialize great people. Uh, we see the proliferation of, of statues appearing in city squares and, and other great, um, you know, civic spaces in different parts of Europe and the rest of the world. So it's, it's part of the kind of sense of trying to capture events. But what I'm kind of interested in is really about this issue of continuity of memory and I think the Aborigines, of course, really embody that. And, and I think it's really interesting in the context of contemporary culture, because we're living in a culture of amnesia, not about memory. It's quite the opposite. Uh, our lifestyles, our, the ways in which we um, 
we communicate with each other, our cultural practices, uh, you know, the, the corporate world is, is one that seems to be much more attuned to this idea of amnesia or memoricide than the issue of memory. And what I mean by that, I mean collective memory. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm kind of interested in this, this question of how you instrumentalize it, how you formalize it. So it basically re is reduced to a kind of object that then can either be venerated or abused, as Yatsik described as the anti-memory or the act of the anti-memorial. Um, so how do you see that mm. manifesting itself in the context of the Aboriginal? Yeah, tradition? look, it's a fabulous question, a series of questions. Um, and I've got several, if I can remember them, I've got several different responses. Um, I think the Aboriginal War Memorial that John Mundine um, put, presented in 1988 has been talked about a little bit in a way as, um, on the one hand, you can read it as a um, contemporary Western memorial, albeit using traditional forms. Um, but Terry Smith writes about it quite as um, being somewhat more profound, I guess, in bringing together Aboriginal knowledges from Arnhem Land um, and practices together. Uh, to, or in, not inserting, but um, disrupting that memorial form. Um, you know, the, 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 pole, the spirits in the poles are alive. They're not, um, you know, it's, it's not a repository of bones. It's a living spirit. And, you know, it, it's meant to be, you know, in, in its um, traditional form, the ceremony involves leaving a material there to rot. It's not something that's preserved and stored in a, um, anyway, I'm rambling, but um, I think that you're right in that my presentation is definitely focused on Western forms of knowledge and memory and, and memorialization. Um, and part of, I think, what I'm trying to think through is what some alternatives, or not alternatives, what some other ways of thinking through that engagement with Aboriginal knowledges and cultures might be and might look like. But it's certainly something that um, I think Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists are thinking about and working with. Um, the, the only second, I mean, I'm, I'm just basically saying, yes, I think it's something to think about, um, that I need to think about. But this, the second point I would make, though, is that um, the idea that there's um, a continuity of memory <clears throat> and even a continuity of cultural practice um, is um, not the case for a great many Aboriginal people um, and Aboriginal nations in Australia. You know, it's a land of, um, cumul you know, I've used the phrase a few times, cumulative, ongoing, systematic intervention and disruption, you know, transgenerational um, traumatic impacts on people that, you know, what does, what does it, you know, this is something that um, Aboriginal people themselves are working out. What does it mean to be, what, what does an Aboriginal form of memory or um, pres pu presence in public space mean? You know, yeah, they're good questions to be thinking through. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you, uh, Ruth, for this. Okay. And uh, um, and I'm sorry. Just uh, again, thank so you, uh, thank you, Hannah, also for pointing out because uh, I, for some reason I can't see on my screen who's raising their hands. And and Hannah's just told me that that, that we had um, questions from also Anna and from Mechtild. So shall we start from Anna? Thank you. Sorry, so, sorry for not spotting hands raised. Oh, that's that's fine. Thank you, Ruth, for a terrific presentation. I'm really interested in the long history and practice of iconoclasm and how we make visible um, invisible histories and, and undo the violence that as um, Mitchell rightly says is inscribed in monuments from the beginning. Um, you presented all, of, all kinds of strategies and I think it's really interesting. I'd like you to, you didn't have time at the end sort of to, to, to wrap it up. 
but I'm wondering if, if this is the case that, um, you know, your first example is of an attempt of a monument replacing another monument and taking that same language. And I think it's really interesting to think about how that fails in certain ways. Uh, we, certain, we saw that in Richmond, Virginia with the Confederate monuments. One strategy was to raise monuments to black figures, but necessarily they were much smaller and weaker than these, these uh, 19th century monuments. Um, so I think it's really interesting to think about then the move towards a counter language, a different kind of genre altogether by artists, by Aboriginal artists. And then in your presentation, it seems that it becomes even more expansive to think about actually taking up space, taking up land that was denied yeah. to these people, uh, making visible these figures on a large scale in murals and then creating you know, entire gardens and memorials. Um, so is that a kind of conscious strategy that you're working through in the local context? I'd be interested to hear your sort of analysis. Thank you. I think it's, um, there's two things there. I mean, the while it looks a bit like a um, linear uh, narrative from, we have, you know, the, the, the addition of a plaque and then we kind of ended up through natural, natural progress to the kind of, you know, expanded environment somewhere at the end. You know, it, it, of course, in practice, things are much more complicated than that. And there's things happening side by side all of the time. Um, I do, uh, you know, and I take on board that there is certainly uh, lots of criticism of the um, strategy, dialogic monumental strategy of, you know, the addition of the plaque or the addition of the um, new interpretation that sits side by side the old one um, for, for kind of both for not for not resolving or for attempting to resolve the kind of disparity of positions. Um, equally, there are others, you know, pointing out the richness of that strategy as well um, in not destroying the original, but leaving it there as a record. You know, you've heard it all before, I know. Um, I think what's true to say, though, in um, terms of Aboriginal um, presence in the landscape. Um, I mean, it goes a little bit back to the questions we were talking about before, which is about um, people seeking recognition in the Western, um, in a contemporary urban, especially urban landscape. Um, that's that where people can see themselves. Uh, there is a kind of linear trajectory of that uh, as Aboriginal, mainly Aboriginal activism and research um, has moved from, um, as I've said, from, from saying we were here or this, the story needs correcting through to we are here, through to we've got our own stories to tell and our own knowledges to be exploring. Thank you. Thank you. That answered your question. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you for this question. So Metil has got the next question. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth, for a wonderful talk. And Anna, for, a question, uh, for your question, because mine is kind of related. And um, when I saw the Jägen uh, statue, I thought, OK, this is very traditional, might be bronze, which you know, in terms of material yeah. is problematic. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's 1968, you know? Yes, that's exactly. And yeah, yeah. so um, I was reminded of discussions, current discussions here. So what um, I'm not a promoter of traditional monuments for, for those who, who don't know me, but we have discussions here uh, from marginalized groups who want precisely the traditional yeah. form of monument mm -hmm. because it yeah. has uh, comes with a history of power, of assertion, of yeah. space making and mm -hmm. um, and um, I have, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I have the tools to argue for um, 
a flower garden instead, <laughs> which sometimes can also seem too tame, too nice, you know, kind of not, not asserting uh, what they're trying to assert in terms of um, reclaiming their own history. Sorry, it's seven in the morning where I am, so I'm also. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, sh I should say the Mechtel, who's again going to going to be one of our speakers, and um, on on the subject of performative monuments, is is connected to us um, live from from Chicago. So we got another massive time difference, and absolutely a very interesting question, Mechtel. Thank you, uh, Ruth. Um. Yeah, but you know, this is a long standing history, a uh, long-standing question about, um, you know, people don't know what's good for them, do they, you know? <laughs> the community history is a, um, you know, the debates between community history and, um, you know, fine art are long-standing, I'm sure. Um, the Jägen statue, as I said, was 1968. Um, and, you know, it kind of contextualizes it, it makes sense that that's what it was looking like is kind of, you know, it is what it is. What's ironic though is that in 2018 there's been a kind of larger version of it, a nine meter version of an Aboriginal man looking rather like Jägen but with less obvious genitalia um, installed in the new Jägen Square in Perth. It's a kind of um, reinvention and reworking of that earlier work I think in a new context, but it's still basically a big sculpt, an even bigger <laughs> bronze sculpture. Um, yeah, I, and, I'm not sure. And, and it is interesting, isn't it, uh, Ruth, that there's, uh, you know, within the discourse, the debate on public art, within the practice of public art, of course, we explore, you know, uh, we challenge the idea very often that public art means a statue in the middle of a square and it needs to be big because the bigger, the more powerful, the more expensive the material, the more powerful it suggests, you know, the, the connotations, you know, and um, and of course, in, in, in our own studies, for instance, in our own MA, we we explore a lot this idea of the ephemeral the, the temporary uh, forms of, of public art but it is interesting that in our it seems that in a sort of in the collective um kind of in the in the cultural sort of collective there is still an association of permanence equals uh, yeah. forever memory uh, um, would you would you agree that there's still the sort of uh, that sort of uh, um, assumption sometimes i think so yeah, I mean, and that, you know, reiterates, I guess, McDill's comment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, can think in Adelaide of a similar example of um, a migrant um, museum where people, somebody donated a statue to the museum, um, which, you know, is everything you would expect from a conventional, here's my idea of what you, what, what should be here and what it needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't mean, I hope I don't sound too dismissive actually of those positions. I don't, you know, I can appreciate why and how, um, you know, these mean and a value, mean something and are valued by people. Um, I don't mean that I know better and it should look different. Um, but, you know, obviously there's a lang larger language and repertoire of ideas, materials, approaches that, um, people could be employing. Definitely. And yes, and Anna, you just mentioned, of course, another class example in London with the insistent on sta statues, of course, the, the recent um, statue uh, of, for the suffragette movement for, for um, uh, that, that created, uh, again, another spark in that, that type of debate. Why, why do we insist on statues? Um, so the mm -hmm. I'm very conscious of time. Can I just check with Hannah for a second? Uh, Hannah, can I just check with you if you can see any hands raised because I won't be able to see them. Yeah, no? Okay, I'm assuming there's no hands raised. Um, okay, great, lovely. And, um, oh, sorry. Tanya, Tanya sorry. Tanya, Tanya. Tanya, Tanya. Uh, <laughs> thank you, sorry about that. Yeah, it doesn't matter so much, but thank you. Um, thank you also for the talk. And I wanted to tie on to what Mechthild said and Anna raised now, the su suffragettes, that was exactly my point when I try to explain to my students in Sweden that 
Well, look, um, in a democracy, what kind of monuments do we need? I mean, do we really just have to give other people's formerly marginalized groups space now in the public? Um, or do we also have to change the design? I mean, shouldn't you know, the values and um, the design go hand in hand. And I think if you look at the um, artistic scene and Mechthild has showed it in her wonderful book, Performative Monuments, uh, this is what happens. I mean, artists know this, they do this since Maya Lin and, and uh, the German counter monuments and so on. And in a way, I think, Ruth, you said this is the new norm. And, but whenever I step outside yeah, university, yeah. No, no, I take, even when take I talk point. to my students, I wonder, is it the, the new norm? I mean, I'm trying to write about democratic monuments. What would this be? How would they look like? It's not just about giving Aborigines or Black people a woman um, space, but it should be about the design um, because it is also connected about fostering democratic citizenships. Mm -hmm. This is my belief. But yeah. I have yeah. to be a very far maybe from mainstream conversations focusing on vandalism. Mm. Thank you for your talk. And mm. Yeah, no, no, it's great, great comment. Thank you. Um, and like I say, the, the well, as I hope I was saying, the, the, the focus on vandalism and statues is probably, it is, is something I'm thinking about for this presentation. Um, so it really has been a kind of beginning think for me around that. So the questions are really helpful. Thank you. Brilliant. And thank you so much, Ruth. And so um, I'm, I'm going to round up now, uh, but just to really say that the these conversations are absolutely open. Um, and so and we really look forward to reinviting, uh, you know, Ruth for for future developments in this research. And and of course, for your responses as well. And when so thank you very much, Hannah, because you've just posted if you see the chat the, um, uh, box right now, you will see that Hannah's posted the, uh, the mm -hmm. Um, page where you can see our next talks and I believe that our next talk is going to be on the 4th of February and it's going to be a book launch uh, called Festival Cities, um, a fantastic book that looks at the history of performance and festival practices as forms of public um, en engagement and, and public interventions. Um, there's there's so many topics that we can talk about and and uh, the other thing I was going to say if you would like to get in touch if you're if you're not from the university would like to get in touch with us uh, simply to go to the to the um, uh, research center um, page and see my contact and Wesley's contact and feel free to suggest if there is a project or, or a particular uh, topic that you'd like to explore and whether perhaps we can collaborate as well. So in the meantime, thank you again. Can we give a virtual round of applause to Ruth and and thanks again for joining us at this time of, of night. And um, it. and it's I love this topic and and I just can't wait to keep keep the conversation going. Thanks everyone and have enjoyed the rest of the day. Bye bye.